Hi, welcome to the next of our series of video lectures on practical electromagnetics for engineers. This is going to be a fairly short lecture about calculating power at the load. Um, it turns out that going through the math gets a little bit tedious, but we're going to skip most of that and just talk about what you need to know to calculate power at the load. So here's our, our diagram of a, a transmission line. We have essentially a, a voltage source with some impedance inherent to it. So everything on this side of these little dots is our voltage source, and so you just basically plug that in. We have a transmission line of length D that has parameters Z naught, uh, our intrinsic impedance in the phase velocity. And then over on this side of this dash line, we have the load, and we're assume we're given that as well. And it turns out that when you have sinusoidal waves, such as are, are traveling down this, this line, the general way you calculate this is you do an integral where you go from zero to basically the period of the wave t so you calculate over one complete wavelength and then basically you just calculate the voltage as a function of time multiplied by the complex conjugate of the current as a function of time and you integrate that and when you plug all of this in you come up with an expression that generally looks something like one half uh, v and multiplied by the complex conjugate of I. And this gives you the average power. And so this is the math that's been done uh, if you solve all of this. Um, but, but that's pretty straightforward. The, the wave comes down this direction. And so you have some kind of power that's instant. And remember, we have a reflection coefficient. So some of that power is actually going to get bounced back toward the generator. And other power is going to move on and be absorbed by the load. And this load power, let's put a star by that, since that's generally what we want to maximize. We want to make sure all of our incident power goes into the, the power of the load. So, so what happens if we take a look at these things um, and look at these expressions? Um, it turns out that, that we know that the, the overall incident power is equal to the power into the load plus the reflected power because here we're not talking about amplitude where things don't have to be conserved. Here we're talking about power and remember power is the amount of energy over time. So at least over um, some period of time, the period of a wave, or on average, the, the power is proportional to the energy. Energy is conserved, therefore power is conserved in, in the general case like this. So all of the power that comes down has to go somewhere. It can't just disappear. So it has to go either into the reflected wave or into the load. And this is what the expressions look like. It turns out that the incident power is just the power that comes down one half times the voltage times the complex conjugate of the current. And it turns out that, remember, uh, the current right, is just equal to the voltage divided by our characteristic impedance. And so when you plug that in, you get this expression right here. It turns out that the reflected power is just whatever comes down and is reflected back. We get the square of the reflection coefficient here because it's the current times the voltage. And with the complex conjugate, that comes out to be the, uh, the, the magnitude squared. And so if you have a reflection coefficient of 1, um, everything's going to bounce back. If you have a reflection coefficient of 0 0.2, 0 0.2 squared is actually 4%, so you're going to get 4% bouncing back toward the load. And then, of course, the load is the incident minus the reflected, and you can plug those in and do the algebra yourself, and you come out with something like this. So just considering the reflection coefficient, again, if we had something like a 50-ohm load and a 75-ohm line for z naught, uh, that's a reflection coefficient of 0.2, and nominally 96%, or 1 minus 0.2 squared of the power would go to the load. It turns out things are a little bit more complicated than that, though. Um, because even though we think, oh, gee, this number is pretty small, even for a fairly decent reflection coefficient, remember that the power to the load also depends on the input voltage. And the input voltage is a function of the distance. And so just to remind you of this, um, remember that what we have is that the impedance coming into the line, so let's write a little z in there, or this impedance right here, z in, um, is a function of d, the length of the line. And it goes by this expression. So remember that, that the impedance essentially repeats itself every two cycles of the wave. And note the reflection coefficient comes down into here. So this gets a lot more complicated. And you sort of need to use a computer to calculate it or a calculator. Um, but remember that this term, v naught, is a function of d because the input impedance is a function of d. And this is just your voltage divider. So, so basically, v naught plus
is going to be equal to the voltage on the generator, as we've seen before, over um, Z in, which I'm calling Z sub D here, over Z in plus the impedance of the generator. And so you have to actually take both of these things into account when you're calculating the power delivered to the load. And it turns out that this second term is actually much more important than the reflection coefficient when you do most calculations. We also have the instantaneous power, which is the power delivered at any point in time. Uh, this one's not used very much because the instantaneous power varies, but um, you can calculate at any point on the line simply by throwing in the fact that the wave varies this way um, as a function of time. And gee, I've screwed this up. These should be little plus signs here. I must have just copied it from another equation. It doesn't really matter that much. But when you throw those in, you can calculate the instantaneous power just by assuming the sinusoidal variation in time. And again, you just, in the usual way of things, um, the power at any time t, and we should probably change this, huh? Because we essentially have the power at any position z and any time t on the wave is just v multiplied by the current i. And that's it for power. Again, the main thing, match the load, have a constant input impedance, don't worry about anything. But if you actually have to calculate the power for a mismatched load, you have to work all the way back to the input impedance to calculate that input voltage.